Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Crazy Money. I am your host, Paul Ollinger, and my guest this week is Kristen Keffler. She's the author of a new book called The Myth of the Silver Spoon, Navigating Family Wealth and Creating an Impactful Life. Kristen is also the founder and owner of Illumination 360, a consultancy where she works with ultra high net worth families, including families worth billions of dollars. Her specialty is helping the rising generation of these families decide who they want to be and how they're going to go out to the world and create their own identity, having grown up in extreme wealth. In this conversation, Kristen and I talk about how our own family's wealth led her into this field, the specific doubts and fears that teen and adult inheritors of generational wealth have to deal with. We talk about the negative messages that society sends to these kids. We talk about the balance rising generation members must strike owning their their family name, but creating their own identity. We talk about how all parents, but especially wealthier ones, can model financial behavior for our kids. And lastly, we talk about what the NFL Hall of Fame can teach us about the likelihood of measuring up to our wildly successful parents or grandparents. This conversation is exactly the kind of stuff that I wanted to explore when I started Crazy Money. I know you're going to find it super interesting. So please enjoy this conversation with Kristen Keffler. Kristen Keffler, welcome to Crazy Money. Thanks. I'm excited to be on with you today. Kristen, when people ask you, what do you do? How do you answer? Oh, man, that's one of the toughest questions, honestly, Paul, because um, so I work with I work with ultra high net worth families. Um, often the families I work with are have active operating businesses. So they're and they're what we would call enterprising families. Um, sometimes they've sold those operating businesses and have liquidity. So they um, have significant resources and generally they're they they need to figure out the the landscape, the psychological landscape, landscape of, of not only having wealth, but or all, not only having money, but also having wealth, which is this abstraction, right? It's this, it's the accumulation of money. Um, and I find it tough when people say, "What do you do?" Because it usually takes a little bit more, um, a little more backstory for them to actually understand, and not just have the initial response, which is, "Wow, rich people need help." Right. When you talk about ultra high net worth, how do you define that? Um, so typically there, there's not a there's not a set definition like an academic definition, but typically in the industry, ultra high net worth is something above 30 million dollars. Most of my families that I work with are actually in the billion dollar range. So they're they're very wealthy. A lot of times, as I said, their their wealth is uh, tied up in significant operating entities. And what kind of problems do you help your clients with? What, what kind of what kind of problems could a billionaire yeah. possibly have, Kristen? So typically, the the kinds of work that I do, um, I work a, with a prime. I work a lot with the whole family system, um, mm-hmm. but I have a primary focus of working with the rising generation in those in these families. So typically, families that I work with have multiple generations who are making decisions together. Whether it's with an operating entity like a a business, then they're actually talking about leadership and strategy for a business. If they no longer have an active business, then they're they're talking about joint assets, right? It could be legacy properties or or the way they're investing. But typically, families like this have still have collective assets. So a lot of the work that I do is with um, with these families and specifically with the the up and coming generation in these families, helping them to build the skills to not only know how to handle money on a sort of transactional technical like you know trust and estate language and just how do you like orient yourself into the space, but more importantly, how do you navigate the emotional and psych- psychological space that money and wealth that it creates a different kind of terrain. And how do you find your way when you've been raised in a family where your name is like the name in town or everybody knows your grandfather or half the town's employed by your grandfather or something like that? And the and the, the psychological space around like finding who am I as an individual? What are my unique gifts and skills and how do I bring them forward? Um, and And just even often, that it's not uncommon for these rising gen to have some some legitimate challenges to to 
finding their own voice, finding their own path and and with no real safe spaces to to say, hey, I'm struggling because as most of them will tell me, like no one wants to hear the problems of a rich kid. Like it's not OK for me to to really be fumbling around because, look, I've been given every advantage. And so I, I feel like a jerk that I can't find my way out of the pa- paper bag. So you have personal experience with family wealth. Is that what brought you into this industry? Yeah, ultimately, the, you know, my my path into this as I have discovered that many people who end up doing this kind of work, particularly on the what we would call a human capital side, not the financial capital side, but really about the people in in these systems. Um, often I find that that people who do this work, they they're just trying to work out some part of their own story, right? Like I I don't think I don't know anybody who says in college, like, oh, I want to go work in, you know, I want to go work with the family dynamics of, of business owning families. Um, it's not so common. And so my my dad is um, my dad was an entrepreneur. The last company he started, he started when I was getting ready to go to college. Uh, I have four or I have three older brothers. I'm the youngest of four. And so he and my oldest brother started this company that was just the right idea of right time you know, economic winds at their back and that all, all the right things happened. And by the time I was getting ready to graduate from college, they were taking it public. So my my dad's vision, unlike the families I work with who often have multi-generational visions for business ownership, my dad's vision was he wanted to take something public. It was like in the mid-1990s, IPOs were sort of all the rage. And um, and so he that's what he wanted to do. And that's what they did. And um, so right around the time I was getting ready to graduate from college, they had um, an initial public offering. They had a secondary offering a little time later, and then they sold the company um, a little time after that. So it was right in a, for me, it was a very important developmental time. I'm exiting college, looking out into the workforce, trying to figure out what I was going to do to 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 be a contributor. Um, and at the same time, my parents, who had always you know, my dad had always been successful. So for me growing up, I really didn't think about money as a thing, right? I just, I like, I just didn't consider it. I didn't consider whether we had more than other people or less than other people, um, which I know is a privilege in itself. Um, and it was at this point in time that, that my, um, dad sold the company that, that they, we started having, you know, my parents obviously had some some wealth events in that time, some some influx. And and we started having family meetings, which was like this totally bizarre thing in my peer group. Right. Like having adult uh, kids get together with their parents and on, you know, a Saturday or a Sunday or over a weekend and talk about things like estate structures and financial plans and, you know, all of the stuff that that is actually quite common in in families enterprising families where there are joint assets but i certainly didn't know that then um and i i found that for much of my 20s i spent i had these parallel experiences where um we were meeting as a family we were you know making decisions i was being asked to sign documents that i generally didn't understand what they were <laughs> um but i would just go do it and because it's like nobody was uh, like you know, these are all people that that we trusted. Right. And it's yeah. like, yeah, you need to go to the attorney's office and they have some paperwork. And I'd go, OK. And I would go down there and sign it. I, I tell you what, Paul, like still today, as um, as my parents are are both aging and declining and we're we're taking over um, medical power of attorney and financial power of attorney and have sold their house and stuff like that, there's still things that are coming up that I'm like, well, when did I sign up to be a trustee on that? Oh, like, funny. I yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, <laughs> so there was these parallel paths for me in my 20s where I was I was really wanting to honor um, the, you know, what my dad had created and be a be thoughtful and be educated and be a good steward of those resources. And I was also on the path of my own life trying to figure out, like, well, what is it? What's the work I want to do? How it, how do I define success? Right. Like I'm looking at at my dad and um, and my oldest brother was a part of this ride with him. And and I'm saying like, well, financial success, everybody from the outside, everybody will say that's success. But like, what if I just want to go have a job in public health? And is that is it good enough to just earn a public servant salary and go to work each day? Like, is that is that 
considered successful in my family and my family's definition. And um, so I spent my 20s in, in these on these two parallel paths. And ultimately, those two things came together for me as I as I got really excited about um, human peak performance and the work of like, how do we really self-actualize and the, in the space of, of using the tools of positive psychology, um, and coaching and like connecting those, um, ideas with family systems work and particularly with the rising generation. And so I've been lucky enough to get to do this work in these, in this really unique, um, situation for the last 17 or 18 years. So as you just described, and as you as you explain in your book, you, it sounds like your family went from pretty affluent to very affluent in a relatively short period of time. Did you feel self conscious about what was happening to you? Did it did it cause problems in your relationships or the way the world saw you? It. Um, I I think I have more awareness now upon reflection than I really had conscious awareness at the time. But I would say that. Um, for me, and you know, I, I tell this story in the book, and this was this was before my dad um, even took the it, like had started and, and taken his company public. But it was my senior year of high school, um, and it's it's the opening story of the book. Actually, it's like I I my dad I had gotten a scholarship to a private university that was nearly full ride, and um, and he said, "Hey, you're saving me a lot of money. Like, why don't we get you a new car?" And um, and I was like. God bless Sweet. him. Right? I was like, awesome. I love yeah. it. And um, and so we went and, and we and I I picked out this car and it was a little black sports coupe. And what kind? Um it was a it, it was an like the high-end Acura Integra at the time. So nice. it was like this nice. this awesome little I mean, I was the legend. It was the legend or the oh, it was the Integra. Okay, nice. The Integra, so it was Still two nice. doors, and they did nice. have a four door version, but mine yeah. was like the sport yeah. two door, uh -huh. like little spoiler on the back, the leather seats, nice. the the high end stereo, like everything about it was, you know, for a seventeen year old was like above my pay grade. Not a BMW, but pretty nice. Lots, of, very tasteful. It was not a BMW. See, but this is like, and this actually, I think, is and this was part of my story. Like, I think is that. Even though my my dad was very successful in his career, the way that my parents raised us, I very much felt middle class. We went to public schools. We like the idea of a BMW for me at that point was like I wouldn't have considered it. So when he said you can have your pick of cars, I went to like a relatively reasonable car for 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 what I could have picked, but I, I picked a relatively reasonable car, but it was still way above my pay grade. Like you stood, you stood out on that high school parking lot. I stood out in that high school parking lot. And that's the, that was, that, that was actually my first awareness of starting to be uncomfortable with like just being uncomfortable. Right. I, I went to go drive to school in these last couple of weeks of my senior year and realized that I didn't want to park in the student parking lot. And then I went over to the teacher parking lot where you're not allowed to park. And I, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to like sneak in here. And then like that car <laughs> stood out like a sore thumb. And I was you, just embarrassed. Probably worse than the teacher's parking lot. <laughs> I know. Right. And I, I have the, I actually still have like the, the imprint, the visceral imprint of what it felt like to get out of my car and like just like sneak into the school and the whole time being like, oh my gosh, I am like, what, what am I? Like, where do I belong? And, and, and also feeling like there's no place for me. Uh, I, I don't think this was conscious at the time. I recognize it now, but like, who the heck was I going to talk to about feeling kind of tangled up about around perception? Like, what did other people think of me? And yeah. what did I think of me? And yeah. and how much of my identity sort of kind of liked the the specialness of that and yeah. how much felt like, oh, my gosh, I don't I don't belong here. So what would you tell 17 year old Kristen right now? Mm. Wow, that's a good question. Nice job. Thank you. I pride um, myself on preparation. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know what? I From where I sit today and. um and what 47-year-old Kristen would tell 17-year-old Kristen, like, 
th- this thing, this material thing doesn't define you. And, and it, it's, it's not something to us that you ha- need to aspire to, nor is it something that you have, like, this isn't, this isn't part of your identity. You can enjoy right. it. Go enjoy it. Like yeah. it can be fun, but don't let this thing get, get to be a tangled part of your identity. And what if some kid at high school made some snide remark to you about your car? What would you tell Kristen to, how, how would you tell Kristen to process that? Dang, I, I commend you on preparation too. I'm, <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting if I put this out of me and I say like, well, what would I tell a client? It's easy. Like it gets sure. all tangled up with, with, with me talking to me. Um, you know what I, what I often will actually say to clients. And so hopefully this would be the good advice I would give me is, is to be able to acknowledge it, you know, don't run, don't hide, don't just say like, yeah, that I'm, that I'm really lucky. It kind of blows my mind too. Yeah. Hey, you know, do you want to go out and grab a coffee? Like, right. Hey, let, let's be in relationship. Let's not let, let it be about this. You can't have the coffee in my car, but but I'll buy you the coffee. Um, <laughs> right. All right. So the whole point of me asking those questions is is to lead into the question that the world sends rich kids messages. Let's talk about the messages that that these rising generations are have been dealing with since they were probably conscious of who their family was. Can you dive into some of the challenges that that these folks handle on a on a day to day identity basis? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so. One of the things that is that is challenging, I think, about what one of the core challenges, one of the contextual challenges is that um, culturally we have a pretty unconscious tangled relationship with money. Right. And like in general, we we know how to transact with it, but but we don't have we, we don't do a lot of the the real deep understanding of what our relationship to it is. I mean, that's your podcast is awesome because it actually oh, pulls thanks. back the curtain on that. And that's the it, looking at and, and inviting people to really try to understand like, what, what is it at the heart that, that I am ascribing? What powers do I give to this thing? That's actually just a tool. And so I, I want to set that context first because it's within that context that the rising gen in affluent and enterprising families like they are they're living in this in this situation where society has significant projections about wealth and money right and 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 they're tangled and confused we we have both collectively we have this sense that people with wealth and money are successful we may have envy or aspire to be them and at the same time, also kind of despise them, think that they might be the root of the <laughs> evil that we're experiencing yeah. and um, and think that that successful people at that level only get successful by stepping on the backs of other people. Right. So there's there's both this like want to collectively the want to like be and kind of admire those that have wealth and also the the want to despise and see that as as money being the root of all evil and so rising gen raised in this in the in situations where their families have prominence in their communities and they and they have um excessive excess financial resources they're getting all of that projection and internalizing that and and you can imagine that so you're born into a situation that you don't have control over it. And there's, there can be immense privilege and like th- there are immense privileges, right? Like the privilege of not worrying about security and where your where food is coming from. And if you're going to have a warm bed to sleep in, like th- those things we are undeniably, um, th- they're a huge leg up. And every one of my clients would, would readily say like, yeah, I was, I was born with, I was born ahead of go. Um, right. Yeah. But where the where what gets challenging is is how quickly and slippery it can be to move from having wealth and money be something that that you can have a healthy conscious relationship with and moving into either over identifying with it. So like feeling like I am important because I have wealth. And because, right, so like it, then it becomes a very important thing to maintain a specific kind of image and 
drive the right car and live in the right neighborhood and and do all the right things, even if you're not earning that income on your own, which then has mm-hmm. this whole other set of right. psychological tripwires. Or I see a lot of rising gen go to the other side of the continuum and way under identify with it. And and that's where it's like they got to move far away They're They pretend like they don't have what they what they, maybe they have access to um, and and do everything they can to try to distance themselves from that, including, um, you know, there's some significant movements now for for inheritors to give away significant parts of yep. or all of their inheritance, which. I I say, great, if that if that is the thing that like if th- that gets to be your choice, if it's something that you're if it, there were res- resources that you're in control of. And I and I still think that. You got to do the the inner work around what this thing is that you were born into in order to know whether giving it away is actually going to heal the wound that's inside. Yeah, I I would say you can make that decision to give it away when you're when you're 40 or older, all right? But not until then, okay? You're like <laughs> right. well, I don't want your your, you know, your college uh, professor telling you what you should do with multi-generational money. Right. But, uh, okay, you talked about identity and I, I thought this was really fascinating. Let's talk about Lindsay. Lindsay's 25 years old, fifth generation money, which is a long time. She says she pulls up to the fourth season in a cool car and everyone treats her like she's special, which feels great for a second until she remembers that she's done nothing to be cool. And she wonders if being Lindsay, if just being Lindsay would be enough. Talk about her dilemma. Yeah. So this, I mean, you, th- that story really captures the heart of the the identity challenge, right? Like, and and so Lindsay, which is not her real name, but is a a client of mine, has been a client of mine, and and this was something that we talked about as a a a core um, sort of metaphor. It wasn't really a metaphor; it was her, it was her experience. But this was like the right, touch point it's her story real for life. her, yeah. right? Like, but and and she was like, this is this is this captures why it's so confusing because she because she said i i i like how it feels to be treated special i and you know at this point in her life she's in her when she was telling me the story she was in her mid-20s maybe 24 ish and she drives up in a car that she hasn't that that is again like my story above her pay grade that she didn't earn the money to buy she didn't pay for um, but it feels fun to drive. And she pulls up to the Four Seasons for lunch and everybody treats her like she's someone. And that feels it feels good to be treated like you're someone. And at that same time, she doesn't have a job. She doesn't know what she wants to do to contribute in the world. She's not earning income and and to her own um to her own, you know, as she admitted to me, she's like, I don't even, I, I don't even know the value of a dollar. Like, mm. I, I feel really foolish that, like, I go to the coffee shop, I don't pay attention to, I just give them the credit card. I don't pay attention to how much I'm paying for the this or the that. And, and in that, you can see how it can become like a hall of mirrors, right? Like, someone who was not trying to unpack all of this psychological clutter would just say like, I don't know, I can, so I will. And 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 ultimately end up really over identifying with family wealth and family name, you know, family prominence. But Lindsay was really like, I get confused because this actually feels kind of fun and I kind of like it. And then I remember like, would these people treat me this way if it was just me? If I was driving up in my Honda Civic and I was yeah. getting out of my car to, you know, go meet a, a friend for a cocktail. Like, would they treat me this way? I don't know. So so while she might not know the value of a dollar, she's at least mindful of the fact that she's trying to create her own identity as a human being within the context of her family's money, but not identifying herself by it. On the, on the other hand, we can all name a half dozen celebutants who have made a, made, a, made a career out of being somebody else's daughter or granddaughter or son or grandson. So where's the right balance? How do you find and how do you help these people explore how to be independent without being able to shake off where they come from? Yeah. You know, I think 
at the heart of it, it's the, the question. Nobody can define what thriving looks like for someone else. Right. I can't tell one of these. What did you call them? Celebutants? Which I think yes. is an awesome yes. word. Um, I can't tell them what thriving looks like for them. I look at that from the outside and I say, wow, like if it all went away and you were left standing with just kind of your own gifts and skills and vision for for what you want to do in the world, like, would you be OK with what was left? I look at that and I think that would have that would have me running fast and feeling scared. Like, I got to keep up with the mm. the fiction I've created, right? The story, the the image that I've created. But I can't say for someone else whether that feels like thriving or not. What I will say is that the the clients who end up coming to me are people who actually want to have two solid feet on the ground and understand who they are separate from the resources that they have access to and separate from the family name that has opened a ton of doors for them so that they ultimately can find what a, a right relationship, a balanced relationship with money and with wealth. Because the people who come to me, ultimately, they want to do something with that, right? They want to take those resources. They feel the importance of, of to he or she who much has been given, much is expected. They feel mm. that, but they don't know how to do it. And, they, and it requires clearing out that, that psychological and emotional clutter that gets in the way first. And, and then figuring out like, okay, now if I, if I understand who I am, then I can, my shoulders can be broad enough to hold that family name. Mm. And, and my, I, I can be discerning enough to know what these resources, what's their best use? How do I, what's their best use in terms of impacting my life? And then from for many of the clients I work with, they they then look up and out and say, all right, what am I going to do with this? Like, how am I going to engage in some kind of impact work or impact giving so that so that I can define my own legitimacy in the space of something that I was born into? Do their parents send them to you? Like, go talk to Kristen, go figure it out. Or do they find you on their own? The most successful relationships like this it's where they they found me if it, i tried early on in in all of this it, i a parent or two would would find me and say my kid needs you but the truth is unless you're really ready to go do the work yourself you can't do the work someone can't tell you hey go clean this stuff up and like learn boundaries and learn accountability and it, like you, you have to decide that that's what you're up for yourself though i will say that at this point in my in my practice, the majority of the work I do is actually with whole family systems rather than individual clients. And that's where the greatest power is, because anybody, anybody who is like their eyes open in their family recognizes that there's all these invisible threads that that tie families together and ways that we interact with each other that can keep us stuck unless we're all agreeing that we're going to like break that break that pattern that doesn't work. So actually working with with whole family systems um, has just made all the difference in terms of really creating a healthier environment for for stronger, more transparent conversations about wealth and money and and how to use it well. So the only thing I know about family systems and wealth are what I see on TV. So I've seen Succession and I've seen uh, Yellowstone, right? So like, what is, what are you helping them with? And, and I mean, do you have to remember that in 1982, somebody said something wrong at Thanksgiving and nobody's forgiven them yet? I mean, like, is, is, is it, is, is the drama from decades past still something you deal with? The drama from decades past is always something that, that we deal with in, in family work, um, because that's what you know, the, sometimes it can be the thing from Thanksgiving 1982 that is causing the the biggest obstacle to a family actually having the conversation they need to have or make decisions together more effectively. So the answer is both yes, like that stuff still comes up. And it's really one of the things that what that I find when working with families is that very often rehashing the past doesn't move us forward towards a vision of the future that everyone can get behind. So and and this comes from, 
you know, I have a background in positive psychology. Um, and so I, I use a lot of those tools, which is really about how do we take what we have and, and turn the dial up on thriving. So instead of like just trying to get to baseline of like, okay, now, now we can all agree we've like hashed out everything in the past and now we're at neutral. I'm really trying to help families like move from neutral to awesome. And, and so a lot of what sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's structure, like systems and structure work. Like we need to have a better governance structure. How do, how do we make decisions together about these joint assets? Sometimes it's, it's working with either individual family units, depending on how big the family is, or sometimes if it's like, if it's a mom, dad, wealth creating generation and their kids just working with that, that nuclear family to help them clarify the, the question of like, what is the impact we want this wealth to have in our lives and the lives of our community? And once that once we can define that, that overarching philosophy, then we have to drop down to like the boots on the ground conversations of, OK, well, then how much do we want family members to have access to this? And how much do we want to put into a foundation? And how are we going to make decisions about the money that we've put into that foundation? And so in from my perspective, it's always a little bit of a little bit of art, a lot of art and a, and a little bit of science in that the, the systems and structures help create more consistent, transparent ways of communicating and making decisions. But you have to have the heartbeat of the family in that. Right. Like you can't just go do the checklist of like, oh, yeah, you got a mission and a vision and value statement. You guys should be good to go. It's really about doing the structural work, but actually really understanding what's at the heart of it for the families and what, where do, where does, where do the family ne members need to, to grow in order to thrive? And then where does the family as a whole need to, to grow? Um, it's complex work and it's, but I, in my experience, it's like, it's hugely satisfying because ultimately the families that start to clear up that family clutter they have the power to to use their wealth in really impactful ways, way more impactful than in our kind of traditional um, government or even, you know, awesome nonprofits out there. But all of those have more um, bureaucracy and and sort of the, uh, the their ability to move fast is hampered by just the way that that they're structured, whereas families with privately held capital can move very quickly. And we saw that a lot, actually. And as COVID was un unfolding and you look at things like what um, Dolly Parton and her foundation did and the Gates Foundation and how quickly they moved into action um, because they could. Let, let's talk about raising rich kids and how we can try to get those young adults that our kids are going to become someday to have the best head on their shoulders possible. So besides having an affair with the tennis pro or ski instructor, what are the most common mistakes affluent parents make? Yeah, and I, I'm going to extend this because I, I I think it's an important um, point for anybody listening to this that that what I'm what I'm about to share is not actually just for the this ultra high net worth, like way out of most people's stratosphere people. Right. Like what I'm about to share is is really like a upper middle class and beyond challenge. It's the it's the snowplow parent. It's the helicopter parent. Um, it's when we have it, it's in the situation when there are more financial resources than we need to meet our basic needs. Then you then you're faced with the challenge of, well, how do I parent based on my values then if external circumstances aren't going to kind of force the the growth and learning that every developing kid needs to learn how to like be autonomous, have personal agency, um, like be gritty. Like, how do I how do I do it? And um, as a parent. No, it's a good it's a good one, too. I mean, I, I think it's important to make that distinction because I think most people don't define themselves as rich. And yet, certainly, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably are in a pretty good place from a financial perspective. You probably don't you're not the richest person, you know, nobody is, but you, you have more flexibility than you think you do. Yep. Yep. You're you're spot on. And and um, 
So what I would say, my, the number one thing that parents do that that causes problems is is they make their kids' lives too easy, right? Mm. It's we we can we can create a buffer both by our social networks, who we know, what we're what you know, what strings we're willing to pull, um, and by the financial resources that that we have. When you're in a situation when you have more than you need to cover your by, your basic needs then you're in a situation where you have um, choice about how you use the, the resources that you have. And there's a, there's a behavioral economics curve that, um, that illustrates this point really well, I think, um, and some of the original work with Danny Kahneman, who is a Nobel Prize um, winning, um, it, it, he won the Nobel Prize in, in um, economics, he's a psychologist. But um, the this it's the curve is called the inverted u curve and the idea is basically that that there's no such thing as an unmitigated good so if you think about um on the xy axis if you think about down in the corner where you have little financial resources and um and you know you're sort of like in the small smalls like very little financial resources um high level of difficulty in parenting as you go up that curve, things get easier, right? Like the more financial resources you have, if you're not worried about the safe neighborhood that you're in or the school that your kid's going to, life gets easier as you're parenting. But there's a, a point at which that that levels off. You might think that it, that that curve would just go on forever, but it doesn't. It's There's a point at which that levels off and then parenting actually starts to get harder again. Because like I said a minute ago, instead of having external circumstances that force us to let our our kids have an appropriate amount of struggle, we can make it really easy on them, right? Where do you think that inflection point is at the top? What's the peak of that curve? I mean, I know it's not an exact number probably. And by the way, Angus Deaton, who did the work with Kahneman around uh, yep. you know, the declining marginal returns of happiness based on income, was an early guest on the show. And that was a thrill to talk to him. But but where do you think, like, it, where is it? It's not seventy five thousand dollars a year, you know that that parenting is is peaking in terms of its easiness. Where where do you think it is? Yeah, I I um, there's different data out there, so I hesitate to give a number because, to your point, like people are there are actually people studying this and trying to understand like where is the where does happiness start to decline? And there there have been um, there's been data in the past that has said like, you know, $75,000, you know, adjusted for time, um, yeah. it is, is about where that peaks. I think that newer research has illustrated that that's probably not exactly the, that that's probably not exactly right, but I think that it's lower than we think that it is. So, right. um, I'm going to, I'll go on record, but go on record with the caveat that, <laughs> this isn't like this is like Kristen's broad, broad range, not the the where I can point to the most recent study in this. But we'll put that in, we'll put that in the footnotes. Yes. Thank you. So, th you know, it's we're, we're not talking like we're not talking like a million dollars a year. We're, we're talking like, you know, one hundred and fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year of of income, depending, you know, there's so many caveats. Where do you live? Are, are you a two income household where, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot yeah, of caveats course. in there, but it's much lower than you actually think. We're not talking about even like millionaire next door wealth. We're talking about you like upper middle class. Yeah. Well, for the families that do have enough, more than enough and are beyond upper middle class, should the parents ever tell their kids, you'll never have to worry about money? I've seen it go wrong too many times to think that that exact phrase is a, is a healthy one. I think that I think that the conversation here's here's what I'll say from the lived experience of working with with rising gen who are told that is that there is so much room for misinterpretation about what that means. I have I have one um, colleague that I work with. She's now in her 60s and she was told. Um, she was told in her teens by by her father that you're never going to have to worry about money. And her mm. interpretation of that was he thinks I'm not capable. Uh, like he's right. right? And, and I'm sure I don't know her father, but I'm sure that that was not his intention. She spent an immense amount of time struggling in her 20s and early 30s 
because because that her message was like, I guess I don't have to work. I guess like I, I guess I'm not capable of working. I think that the message you'll never have to worry about money is far too simplistic and it there's too much room for misinterpretation. I think that that a parent, if what they're trying to say is, hey, I don't want I, I want you to have freedom of choice. I want to support you to go be as awesome as you can be in the world. And we have the resources to help back you up so you can do that. Then then that's a different message than you never have to worry about money. Ultimately, one of the things that that is I think problematic is that removing the financial need to work doesn't remove the human need to work. We as humans, we are wired for contribution. So we have a system set up widely bought into by most of us where where we we assess our value by what we get what we earn, what we get paid, right? And so there's this cycle of like I work, I get paid whether you're happy about what you're doing or not is different, but like you have this sense of contribution because there is this cycle, this agreement that that particularly in a in a capitalist country we've set up that says, you know, I work and I get, you know, I put value in and I get value out. What happens when when parents say you'll never have to work, the message gets so confused because it's like or you'll never have to worry about money. The message gets so confused because it's like, well, but contribution is actually a core part of the way that we that we illustrate to ourselves and to others that we matter. And mattering is a is elementally important to well-being. And so this is like the the conversation is it can't be so simplistic, even if you have it set up that your kids never do have to worry about money. There's a different conversation if you actually want to talk about self-actualization versus like income. I'm going to break out Maslow's hierarchy of needs at dinner tonight with my kids. <laughs> yes, as you, <laughs> you see this tippy top little triangle, kids, that's what daddy's is striving for you. <laughs> right. And they're going to be like, what the hell? Or can we watch The Simpsons, please? <laughs> um I could talk to you for hours about this because I just care so much about this issue. And I think it's so misunderstood at, at a societal level and certainly at an individual level as well. So like, how do we as parents who have the good fortune to have more than we need, how do we model the kind of behavior that's going to give our kids the best chance they have to get to work towards self-actualization? Yeah. Yeah, it's such a great question. Um like with most things, we we can't we can't uh, ask our kids to do something that we're not able to do ourselves, right? You can't ask your kid to to self actualize if you're not on the path of trying to do so yourself. You can't ask your kid to have a healthy relationship with money if you're not actively in the process of trying to clear your own relationship with money and make sure that you understand what it is and what it isn't, and um, and so I think that as parents, being, again, like going back to that inverted U curve where, where at the heart of it, when, when you get to the, to the crest past the top of the curve and you're, you're in the hard part of parenting again because you have more financial resources than you need, the, the real question is, what, what is it that I find most valuable? What are the values and the character traits that have been most useful to me on my path? And how do I make sure I am I am expressing and inviting those in my kids? How am I role modeling those in my kids, or role modeling that in my life for my kids? And um, so I think one, it takes an immense amount of willingness to be thoughtful and not just unconscious in your parenting. What we What we know is that there are some character traits and um, and character strengths that are particularly useful for lifetime success. And they are things like grit, growth mindset, curiosity, love. Um, so as a parent, if you want to like stack the deck that that your kids are are going to have what it takes to stand on their own two feet and find their way in, in life, um, really understanding how do you how do you um, parent for those character strengths is 
is probably your best shot. And the way that that money gets overlaid with that is that it, it can create this buffering effect, right? It's like it's if you don't have to be gritty because because um, you have the resources to gain access, you know, like you didn't have to work hard to get to the to the A team. You actually, um, I don't know, you had a parent who was willing to sponsor the team, so you got on the A team, right? Like those are the situations that, as parents, we need to be really thoughtful about because. At the heart of it, wealth or no wealth, there are, you know, resources or no resources, there are core character strengths that that support lifetime success. And so when there are resources that can create a buffering effect from building those character strengths, then that's when we need to like sit back and say, what am I actually trying to parent for? And then and then be thoughtful about how you do that. You bring up three things, and there's probably more, but there's three things that that wealthy kids deal with more so than others don't deal with. Infantilization, paralysis by choice and freedom, and then the fear, the deep-seated fear that they will not measure up. I want to talk about each of those briefly, and then I want you to tell the NFL Hall of Fame story about measuring up. So let's start with infantilization. <laughs> Yeah, so this is it's funny I was just in a conversation yesterday with a advisory group for one of the families that I work with and and this was coming up that this this idea that families that have they they can hire the the best and brightest advisors, right? So they're great estate planning attorneys and tax attorneys and and financial advisors and um and you know, really competent staff that that make things happen for the family. One of the things that that can happen in having all of those competent people who are showing up to do their job the best they can is that they can remove the need for these for rising gen to learn skills like, you know, filing a tax return, getting their car to like getting the registration for their car taken care of, like things that are just part of like it's learning about it's adulting. Like, how do I be responsible for the stuff in my life? And so that um, infantilization is one of the things that can just be a byproduct of people trying professional people hired by the family trying to do their job in the best way they can, but removing in doing so, removing some of the the important tasks that kids need to build. So that's one. Do you remember the movie Arthur? I'm not sure I ever saw Arthur. Dudley Moore played Arthur, the the spoiled heir to this huge fortune. <laughs> I do remember. I do. Wow. That's in. He's a 45 year old man child, and, yes. and uh, his butler draws his bath for him, and all this kind of stuff. It's it's like. Yeah, that's like the Wayback Machine. Yeah, sorry, I'm 53, uh, Kristen. <laughs> that's okay. So, in fact, so paralysis. Now let's talk about paralysis by choice and freedom. I have had, by the way, I've had Barry Schwartz on here, the author oh, nice. of the Paradox of Choice, yep. right? And so, what we learn is that humans. We like a limited amount of choice. We we think as Americans that choice equals freedom and freedom be good. So more choice is great. But it turns out that past a few choices, we get all locked up. We don't know what to do. We take longer to decide. And we end up regretting our choices. Yep. And that's when we're talking about super genes or cereal. So what does it mean when you're 25 and you don't have to work? How do you choose what to do? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, this really gets at the heart of Schwartz's work, right? I'm I'm delighted to know that that you've had him on. The paradox of choices is, is that's real. It's like a real challenge. And and so the this idea of of paralysis by possibility is is at the when you have the ability to choose many things, because it's not like you're like, I got to pay rent. So like, I'm going to go start tending bar and I'm going to figure out how to get some money going because I got to pay rent. Then I'll figure out how I'm going to get myself into school. And, and, you know, if I want that graduate degree, like there's, there's a different challenge that, that when, when you don't have to, to go, when you have choice, like I want to go back to graduate school. And as long as you can get in, you can make it so. And you don't have to necessarily worry about working while you're in graduate school. And you don't have to worry about, am I going to get employed right after I get out of graduate school? Like, these are all things that make it so it's 
when, as I've seen with with the rising gen I've worked with, they may already have a lack of confidence that that they have what it takes to do whatever it is they say they're going to do. Right. They, that That's something that not this isn't a blanket statement for all rising gen. And it is a common thing I see in many of them is they already have this sense of like the question of their own legitimacy. Like, do I measure up? Like, I, I haven't proven myself. And if I if I did prove myself, I still don't know how much my family name or resources helped me get here. And and so in those situations, they already have some lack of confidence. And um, and when there's a universe of possibilities and no financial imperative to go have to make something happen, what happens is that that they can lean into something. And if it really gets harder, they feel like, I don't know if I, I don't know if law school is right. I'm going to like I'm I'm exiting out pretty soon. What they end up teaching themselves it unconsciously is. I don't have what it takes. And so without so that that paralysis by possibility creates a situation that where it seems like lots of choice would be awesome. In fact, it it can be really paralyzing. Well, that leads right into the last one, right? Fear of not measuring up. Yep. It's I mean, it's tough. And I will say, you know, I probably had like the baby version of this with my own father. And I say the baby version one, because you know, he's a different gender than I am. And and two, because I, I think that the success he created and at the, at the specific time of life he created it, like it, it had some ripple impact for me. But it but I also had a I was formed in many ways at that point. Like, you know, I was I was a late teenager. I already had a sense of of ability and and whatnot. But the 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 families I work with where they're particularly where they have a significant name or they're well known in the community because of the business they own and the wealth that they have, it it can be very tough to 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 feel like good enough. You can be above average. You could be a smart 20 something going out and trying to make your way. And if the if the the bar of success that you have is a father or grandfather or grandmother who was the the Midas touch kind of person, it's pretty tough to to measure up to that bar, even if you're like pretty stellar. But not that many people become, you know, multimillionaires and billionaires. So let's talk about the NFL Hall of Fame and and tell me tell me why you want to use this metaphor for your clients. Okay. Well let me uh, so let me give you the frame up first. I my husband who's just like he's smart as a whip. He's a mechanical design engineer. And he just he's he's awesome because he thinks about things in a different way than I do. And about a year ago, when I was, you know, I was I was just starting to draft the book and and we were talking about this idea of of measuring up. And he was like, he was like, I wonder what the stats are for fathers and sons in the Hall of Fame. And I was like, I I don't know. Let's look it up. And he he went and he like went down this whole rabbit hole and and it was like quite a powerful parallel. So if you want to read it, because it is, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it drives home okay. the point. All right. In 2020, there were 73,000 athletes who uh, participated in the national NCAA. Of those, 16,000 athletes were eligible for the draft and only 254 got drafted. That's a tight funnel, right? Like it's it's like this. Yes. You know, wide at the top, very, very narrow at the bottom. And by the way, I don't even qualify for the top of the funnel. <laughs> That's 1.6% of NCAA, all divisions football. Division three doesn't count, by the way. That doesn't count. But anyway, <laughs> but your point is still relevant, right? 1.6% uh, of all NCAA football players got drafted for the NFL. Approximately 28,000 players have ever taken a snap in the NFL, and only 363 of those players have been elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Additionally, of those 28,000 players, there have been 280 father-son combinations who have played one snap in a pro game each. Only 1% of all fathers have a son that have played in the NFL. Uh, there is not a single example of both a father and a son player who have both been elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Right? So what does that say? I you know, I think the the point of that of of detailing that out was that we we put 
the clients, the people I work with put an immense amount of pressure on themselves to to be as as awesome as their mom or their dad or their grandfather, or whoever in their lineage was this lightning in a bottle kind of success creator. And and it's unfair, right? It's unfair that right. like there's no doubt they've been given incredible advantages um, and that and that they should do something. They can do something with those advantages. But self-actualizing doesn't mean that you're going to go be as awesome in business as the person who came before you. And I think that the point about the NFL Hall of Fame is like, look at it when we're looking at athletic skill. Right. And in that particular example, what you'll note is that I didn't take into consideration any of the Hall of Fame people that were in because they were owners. Right. I was just looking at players. <laughs> right. Which could because there are owners in the Hall of Fame. Right. 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 Yeah. So so I we, we took we took that data out and we just looked at the people who were players and the players were really talking about talent. Obviously, there's an immense amount of genetics, but but then there, it's the nature and nurture of like how much work ethic is in there? How much did they, were they just born, pay, you know, paying attention to certain things that other people weren't? And, and, um, ultimately when you look at the, the data just from that one little, that one little parallel, it's like, yeah, it might be a little unfair for us to think that just because someone's dad was the most awesome football player that, that his son would be that too. And I think the parallel holds true for, for the work that that I do in the space that is generally it's like success that's been created through business. So maybe to those to these rising gen, let yourself off the hook. Don't try to be your grandfather, be you. Yeah. Yeah. Like the reason that that your grandfather was so awesome is because he he chose the path that for whatever reason he knew was his or your grandmother, right? She knew was hers. Like that's the that that's each one of our jobs, right? And as parents, that's that's really our charter to our kids is like, how do I help you like just show up and go crush it in the world because of your awesomeness? How do you know that you're so awesome that you go just show up and do your thing in a way that creates so many positive ripples? And so that's the point. It's the take home. Kristen, I love I, I love that you're talking about this. This topic is exactly why I started the podcast, and I appreciate the in depth and academic and empathetic work that you've done here in the book, "The Myth of the Silver Spoon: Navigating Family Wealth and Creating an Impactful Life." By my guest, Kristen Keffler. Kristen, where can our listeners find out more about you? Thank you for that. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. You can Kristen Keffler. It's K R I S T I N uh, Keffler K E F F E L E R. I'm not a big social media person. I just am, <laughs> like I know I should be. It's like I generationally should be. You need a TikTok, Kristen. But <laughs> I know. Believe me, the the PR people I've been working with are like, "What? You're not on Twitter?" And I'm like, "Oh." Uh. I haven't posted in like 10 years, but I do have an account. Um, but you can also find me. My website is um, Illumination360, um, I-L-L-U-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N 360. And then the book is on there, uh, forward slash myth. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. It's great to talk to you. Likewise, Paul. I'm really honored I got to be on. Thanks for letting me share. Hey, everybody, if you like what we're up to here at Crazy Money, do us and yourself a favor by following the show on your favorite podcast app and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Also, click the link in the show notes to subscribe to my new Substack, where you'll get biweekly thoughts on the role of money in our world and in our lives directly to your email inbox. Thanks for sticking around. We'll see you next week. 